cell administrator. But I thought we'd start with introductions because I don't know everybody here and you may not know everybody here. So, Kevin. I'm Kevin, member of Center for Teaching and Teaching English. I'm Laura, and I'm the Center for Teaching and Teaching English. Kathleen Ziska, I'm the Program Manager for the Capital Crossroads Careers Program. Jackie Jimenez, Development Program. Josie Roy, Nursing Faculty. Joan Edwardson, Nursing Laboratory. Jeff Crawford, Humanities. Marie Gage, Director of Academic Business Center. John Marsh, Business and Technology. Sharifa Susu, adjunct in business. Nancy Guardia, Management, and Center for Teaching, and Welcome. And Danielle Rivers, um, Humanities, I teach English. Welcome to What is Your Cultural <laughs> Competency Quotient? <laughs> um, how many people come from a family where English was not? spoken at home or not the only language spoken at home? Okay. How many of you speak another language? Okay. And how many speak more than two languages? Okay. okay. How many of you have traveled outside of the United States? Okay. And how many of you have lived outside the United States? Okay. <laughs> Metza, Metza. Huh? Okay. Oops. Today's goals. We're going to talk about culture. We're going to discuss cultural competence and we're going to review these topics as they relate to you as an individual, an educator, staff person, and to take a look at the college as an organization. Okay, what is culture? Discuss among your friends. Customs. Customs. Language. Language. Norms. Norms. The way people do things. The way people do things. Arts. Arts. Traditions. Traditions. Food. Language. Rituals. The values and norms. You get, I think, an A. Uh, and traditions that affect how individuals or a particular group perce perceive, think, interact, behave and make judgments about their world. Okay, this is by Chamberlain who um, <coughs> has done a lot of research on culture. Um, I'm gonna, since we're talking about culture, let's take a look at our culture here at Capital Community College. We're gonna look at some data for fall of 2011. Quickly. C. What's the answer? C. 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 As I do with my students, how many think A? How many think B? How many think C? How many think D? Ooh, the correct answer is D. There are 4,512 students enrolled this semester. All right. How many males attend this college? A. A is the answer. So therefore, they're 70% female. How many Asians are at this college? Two. Two Asians or 2%? <laughs> the answer is B, 3%. How many black students? I know. It's B, 33%. B. Latinos? A is the answer. And for those who are keeping track in math, <laughs> B, 21%. So, 
How'd you do with his ethnicity? Failed. Failed? Okay. Age group, 24 and under. The answer is D. Yeah, it's been going up, so it's up to 45%. And 25 to 29? See, you're afraid to say the answer because you don't know. The answer is B, 17%. And you can't trust anybody over 30, so 30 and above. Again, do the math. Yeah, right. There's two fa twenty thirty-eight percent, see. Nationality. I was told that there is no nationally inf nationality information in the banner system. However, the ESL program keeps that information. <laughs> um, so how many different countries are represented in the ESL program? And perhaps there are more represented that aren't in the ESL program, but in the ESL program. How many different countries do we have? The answer is D. 38 different countries are represented. OK, 69% from the Americas. And when I say of the Americas, we are the only country that says there is two continents, North and South America. The rest of the world says it's one continent. How many people knew that? OK. 13% um, are from Europe. 10 are from 8, 10 percent from Asia, 7 percent from Africa. Does anyone know where Burundi is? Burundi. What continent? Africa. Belarus. Europe. Europe. Mali. Africa. And anyone know what Burma is now called? Myanmar. Okay. All right. So we always have students that I have to look and ask them, well, where, where is your country? Because I don't know. Okay. And I'm pretty culturally competent. Okay. Um, languages in the ESL program, 69% speak Spanish. That's up from last semester, which was 62%. Most are Peruvian. It's the largest group, about 25% are Peruvian. The second largest language group is Albanian, and Ukrainian is the third largest group. Okay. <coughs> so now we've warmed up a little bit. Why cultural competence? And take a look at this information. And what discipline is this referring to? Business. Business is very concerned about cultural competence. What other disciplines are concerned about cultural competence? There's, there's at least two representatives in this audience. Not humanities. Healthcare. healthcare. Business world, healthcare are two of the major camps that spend a lot of money, take a look at this, and the third is education. Education. Okay. International relations. Now, usually when we do these workshops, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Um, the people that need to be here aren't here, usually. Um, so, but as an educator and a staff person, I'm assuming you may have heard of Parker Palmer, but good teaching takes myriad forms, but good teachers share one trait. They're authentically present in the classroom, they're deeply connected with their students and their subjects. So being part of, being culturally co competent is the desire to be authentic and deeply connected with your students and their subjects. And I think even 
those of us that have taught many years, it's always beneficial to reflect on why we're teaching um, and uh, being culturally competent and, and thinking about being authentic and connecting with your students. At least that's why I'm in teaching. Um, I'm assuming that most of you are too. Um, um, I've also been working in human service organizations and social justice is a big thing for me. So cultural competence, um, a lot of people who are into it in the humanities and in the social service fields are there for social justice. Um, I'm wearing my little pin here from Spain, which is written in Spanish, and it says, combate el racismo, okay? So it says, fight racism. Now this is a pin that was provided by the federal government. Spain spends money, the government spends money on fighting racism, okay? Because they have a long history of what? Throwing everybody out that wasn't like that, <laughs> okay? Um, they got rid of everybody in the 15th century and then um, when I lived there in 1980, it was very rare to see a black person in Spain. And I remember seeing toothpaste with a Sambo-like person on the, the tube of toothpaste. So you would see stuff, you know that brand? In Singapore they had that brand when we first moved there. Really? It was, and it was called Darkie. Darkie? Yeah, with a black man with white teeth. Yes, and yeah. They changed, it, they changed it while we were living there to Darkie. <laughs> really? Darkie. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was quite surprised that they, um, you know, they would, when a black person, usually a North African, would come down the street, people would look at them like they were from another planet. And they hadn't seen, a lot of people had not seen many people that were different from them. Um, but if you go to Spain now, it is very culturally diverse, and as a result of that, entry of people, a lot of Vietnamese came, and a lot of the immigrant waves that we've had, they've also had, particularly um, North Africans, and um, it's very different, and they were having problems, so the federal government has spent money. I have um, some posters that I saved that would be in the metro about um, people calling uh, negative names about people who were um, from South Africa, I mean not South Africa, from South America. Um, they call them Sudakas. They don't like people from South Africa. I mean, they have the prejudice above that. So anybody who, the, Gar Garcia Loca, who's gay, um, uh, uh, Hawkins, who is, has physical challenges, um, anything that de dealt with people that were different, they had this whole campaign about not being uh, prejudiced. And so, it's interesting to me when, with the Obama administration and his social, socialistic programs and socialism that we have here in this country, Spain spends, and other countries do spend money on uh, fighting uh, racism and, and, and prejudice and the educating first people. Post-racial president. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. We don't, we don't do this. It's all over. It's all over. Yeah, it's fixed. Okay, so what is cultural competence? It refers to the ability to interact effectively with people of a different culture. It comprises four components. Awareness, okay, so just being aware, and that's the reason why I gave you some information about capital. Um, we all have our perceptions, we all have our attitudes, um, and we all need to have some knowledge um, sometimes our attitudes and the knowledge helps us change our attitudes. And the last part is the skills, to develop the skills. Like everything else, our athletic ability, our intelligence, our ability to see, we're all on a continuum. And like every other discipline, they invent their own jargon. Um, I don't think the terminology is important so much, but um, from the negative side, you have cultural destructiveness, and it increases to incapacity, to cultural blindness, uh, cultural precompetence, and cultural proficiency. 
Okay. So what they what the experts say um, is that of the awareness, attitudes, knowledge, and skills, we're all on the continuum. So our awareness may be higher, maybe towards pre-competence, but maybe our knowledge is in the blindness stage. So we're all in different areas. Um. Now, your cultural awareness. You're going to leave here unscathed. This is the, the meaty part of this. Anybody have a pen or a pencil? You need one? Okay, so your first task, think about the various cultures to which you belong and write them down. You can put them in the circles, and if you run out of circles, you can draw more circles or put them underneath. Anyone want to share a culture they belong to? Hartford. A Hartford culture. West Hartford culture. Can we get a chance to write them down? Some of us need stimulation, so. What about like women? What do you think? Gender. Yeah, gender. Feminist. Yes? Capital. Capital Community College has its own culture. And even though you retired, Joan, you're still part of that culture. <laughs> and please cheat and look at your partners. You may. No pen? No. OK. okay. As you continue, or some of you continue writing, think about the beliefs, values, perspectives, and bias that come from those different parts of your identity. I'll email you this stuff. Okay. Step number three. What is the impact of each of your cultures on you in your life? Just to think, just to think, and here's the hard part. Prioritize the importance of your cultures. Now, if you don't want to just do the ones that, you know, put one next to the ones that you think are more important, two against the, um, next to the ones that you think are a little less. Yes, we're flexible. Yes. 
part of your culture. Now, is it a Star of David? <laughs> Okay, reflect. Anybody want to share what this was like, what you came up with, any surprises? We're all friends. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that when we, when we started uh, talking about our individual cultures, immediately I began writing down the, my ethnic cultures. Um, that was, those were the first things that came to mind. And then things that have more to do with um, my value system. You know, like Such as? Being, um, you know, a womanist, feminist, um, being uh, academic, being a mommy, um, being a 40-something divorced professional with kids. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it was very interesting, too, to line up some of the stereotypes. But when you came down to actually the things that mattered, the things that mattered to me really had nothing to do with my ethnicity and all had to do with, um, well, my African-American ethnicity, but all the other ones I really kind of, I, I guess I don't know that much about them, being German or being Pennsylvania Dutch or being Native American, those things don't really matter to me. But being a poet and a mommy and an academic mattered the most to me. And I, and I thought it was interesting. Anybody else? I just found that the things that were, were most outwardly obvious about me that probably anybody could mention, you know, Anglo Saxon, you know, white guy, uh, <laughs> were like the least important things in the class, you know, that, that, was, that was the point of attention now. Um, that didn't make it out here. Um, but some of the ones that were more obvious were the least important to me. Some of the ones I really like. Like the outward, the outward appearance things were these. Really what are you saying, Jeff? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, how, how right, right. the things that are obvious of me, like gender, race, um, that sort of thing, were less important than, say, values, vegetarianism, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, uh, my views on politics and social justice. And, and think about when people see you, what do they see or know you? you know, when they see you, are you, they see a black female, do they see a white male, you know? And then what do you think is more important? Anybody else want to share? A lot of that depends on context, too, because uh, when I was talking to Jeff about Because? Because the, the diversity the, the, of, of our college. Okay. So, I mean, I, I just spent an hour and 20 minutes teaching you know, Harvard Renaissance poets and, and Invisible Man in my American Lit class. You know, and, and I, I, I whenever I do that, I, I, I feel comfortable, but I also feel white. You know, and I'm very conscious of that. You know, did you teach that also at UConn? No, I taught Asian American Literature. Though. Okay. I taught Asian American Literature in Singapore, and I taught it at CCSU, and I taught it at UConn. That was kind of interesting. 
Okay. But that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Before I came to Capitol, I taught at um, Quinnipiac for a couple years, and um, I felt different because I wasn't blonde and blue <laughs> I really felt like at Quinnipiac. I felt a diff yeah, I really felt like I stood out. I didn't feel like I was comfortable on that campus, or well, I mean that's overstating it maybe, but I did feel very aware of who I was as a working class child of immigrants. And uh, so, you know, my skin color blended in with everyone else, but I felt very different just for other features and uh, socioeconomic status wise, felt really different from my students. Yes. I have a hard time keeping the characteristics dependent from one culture versus another, but when you were saying you prioritize them, mm -hmm. I started thinking, okay, do I work long hours because I'm in the East Coast financier, or do I work long hours because of the religious background I can't afford it? So, Are you I, Jewish? I, no, I'm not. Okay. Kids make a mistake all the time. Yeah. You know, I, I, I did. I was thinking that. Yeah, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. I live in West Hartford, there must be a <laughs> And I tend to explain things in Yiddish, but that's just <laughs> <laughs> You know, did I get into this field because of the hours I'm used to working, or am I working two kinds of hours because I got into this field? Okay. So I had a hard time prioritizing things because I didn't know what was motivating that. Hmm. Anybody else? Coming from the business world and teaching and management, you know, we talk a lot about being identified by we identify ourselves by what we do. And the first question we ask people is, so "What do you do?" So, it's, and it's interesting that, that um, I put my ones, instead of, of um, with my job or anything to do with capital, uh, I, my ones were with family and friends. And when I went back to look at that, I thought that was strange because I always identify, I think of myself by my job first, usually. So I thought that was odd that my family and friends come first, thinking of culture. It's really interesting because if you start out with the, with the business world being very concerned about cultural diversity and comedy and something else, and you ask where, what do you do? I remember an early tutoring experience with a Latino student who was very assertive about, you know, where he's from and, and and was very critical of American culture in that way. And he, he always said, why is it Americans always ask what do you do? When he, said, he was Puerto Rican and he said, we ask, where are you from? Where are you from? That's the first thing we ask. We don't ask, what do you do? It's like, that was, so it was interesting. That was, that was the priority for him. So maybe in the business world, we need to start asking, where are you from? Not what do you do? It's myself. So it's just, that made me think of it when, when you said what you said. The Chinese ask, how do you eat? It's true. It's a, it's a greeting. It's a greeting yeah. Which just means, uh, how are you? Mm -hmm. I like that. Well, Murray? Yeah. No, no, it's just, it's just like, how are you, are you well? Are you well? No, it's a formula. It, yeah, it actually, uh, actually, if you're not going to feed me. Well, we say, how's it going? It's a history, it's history of that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, oh. Marie? That's right. My husband's name is Trevor. It's nice. When you're married to someone from a totally different background, culture, you, wait, and you realize how Don't 
know what I am typically, you know, and so what I find interesting is how they change their view or how they um, behave towards me when, when I do read you, you know, what I am. And I find that a lot of students here. Yeah. yeah. It's just a whole different sort of reason. I mean, they get more relaxed or what, I don't know, but it's just, I, I experience that a lot and it's very fascinating. Yes, I also pass. Yes. <laughs> yes, all, it's been the story of my life, actually. It's very bizarre that um, my brothers, I had four older brothers, and I'm the darkest skinned of all of us, and I had very curly hair, and they used to call me Spick. And that kind of st stuck. Um, people assume that I'm Latino because I speak Spanish. Um, I have a lot of vowels in my name. And, and when I, with my family, they sometimes think, how can they think that you're, you know, that you're Hispanic or Latino? And I, I said, I don't know. And they've been in situations where I will introduce myself, I'm say, and I'll say, hi, I'm Carl, how are you? And they'll go, Carlos, nice to meet you. <laughs> and it's just kind of bizarre. And so I have had Latinos say to me, I know you're Latino. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> White, yeah, and so it's it's interest. It's been very interesting. And when I lived in Spain, I passed, you know. So it's very different than a, if a blonde, blue-eyed person. Not that there aren't blonde, blue-eyed people in Spain, but um, you know, I passed. So it was very easy for me and very different for me than someone who was blonde and blue-eyed, or any other different complexion in Spain. So uh, it's been it's been interesting. Um, <laughs> and it's amazing how just that little thing can make a difference. I, and, and as I was thinking about this presentation, I went down and got something to eat, and I saw some Latino students in our program, and Marie, what do we say when we see people eating? Buen provecho, que aproveche. It's just part of the custom. You tell, when you see people eating in the Latino world, you say, you know, like bon appetit, or you know, enjoy your food. It's just part of what you do. And, um, you know, we, those things become part of us. Uh, yes? So do you feel that one of the ways you got into learning Spanish and being part of ESL programs was because of this identity that was sort of forced on you? You look Spanish or you look Latino? No, I mean, I had the, you know, that little thing, you know, the joke among my brothers, of, among many jokes of my older brothers, as you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, that was just one of them. And then in high school, I wanted to take Italian because you had to take a language. I'm half Italian. Um, they, didn't, they stopped offering it that semester. So I said, well, let me take Spanish because it's practical. And so I took Spanish, and then I ended up taking four years of it. And I became obsessed with perfecting my Spanish. And um, I uh, studied in Puerto Rico, and I lived in Spain, but also when I brought this up, when I studied in Puerto Rico and I would go to class, if anyone brought food in the classroom, if you did not offer it to the rest of the class, you were considered what? Well, you were just considered selfish or stingy. It was just part of the culture. So I just, you know, it surprised me that someone would come and you know those, those packs of gum that have like 30, I mean, that's what they would bring to class because they knew that if I'm going to have a piece of gum, I've got to offer it to everybody else in the class. And that was just part of the culture. Um, so there's all these little nuances that, that we have in our cultures. Um, when I lived in Manhattan, not only do they ask you what you do, but they ask, where do you live? All right, because they want to check out where in Manhattan do you live. And if you live outside of Manhattan, then you're really not a New Yorker, because you, you, you know, they consider themselves, so you have that part of it too. Very American um, to say, what do we do? Because well, we define ourselves. And I think the biggest experience that helped me with my culture is to live outside of the United States. And I would encourage any parent to encourage their children or provide for your children to live outside of the United States. Mark Twain said, uh, right. uh, travel is fatal to prejudice. Yes. Yeah. And it really helps you with your identity, yeah. I think, is who you are. 
Um, I had my Spanish friends say to me, you know, oh my God, you Americans are so racist. You know, they talk about the, the 60s and how we treat black people. And I said, hello, gypsies? I mean, you know, they, it's funny how different cultures don't see their own prejudices and biases. Um, so, um, and they threw out, as we all know, everybody um, in Spain. So, uh, yes, living in another culture really makes you see other aspects, but it also helps you identify yourself. Because I never really thought what it was like to be an American. You know, I got a lot of crap for being an American when I lived in Spain. Um, and so it's like, okay, what is an American? We're this, you know, melting pot of ethnicities and stuff. It's not like so many of the European and other countries where you have one ethnicity or group of people. So. Anyway, good conversation. This is the part that you, you facilitate. I, wanted, I, wanted, I have one little tip. Yep. You said it's a good idea to send your children overseas or somewhere. Yes. I sent my older son to Texas. And that, <laughs> 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 yeah, that was like the other end of the world. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Living in other parts of the United States, too, is a, is a good second. Yeah. Because people in the West are so much more welcoming and friendly. And so, and, so, and so much easier to make friends. Than, yeah. And I, after having just been there, I, what I noticed is people are more, um, it seems like uh, they enjoy life more. So they're outside more. And they're, well, because of the weather. Mm -hmm. One of the, the things that I thought was most important after that experience was it's not so much of where you come from. It's we're all human. You know, peop, if take a, someone who lives in you know, the Northeast in Maine and put them in California, I think they will start acting like someone from California because of the weather. The weather is, is a big difference. If you look at all these countries and you know, when I would go to different countries, even in India, the northerners where it's warmer are always considered the more ambitious, industrious person. And then the people from the south are always considered the, the more lazy because it's warmer, you know? And it has, to me, it has very little to do with, you know, the indigenous people. It's just that this is what climate does to human beings, you know? So that was my conclusion. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Um, your cultural attitude, gender roles. Um, just think for a minute about what your attitude are, is about gender roles and how they may have changed over the years and how it's changing this. What? There's a generational. Definitely. Shit. Definitely. You know, what our parents did. You know, my father's thing was I provide for this family. It doesn't matter that you've never eaten with me, and I never did eat, eat with my father, my whole family, but he owned a business, and his thing was, I'm gonna provide for this family and, and my five sons. Greetings. In Spain, and in many places in Europe, what do you do when you greet somebody? You kiss them. Sometimes you kiss them on one cheek, sometimes you kiss them on two, sometimes you kiss them three times. But those are all part of your attitudes, um, Eye contact. Some cultures, what? Liberating your eyes is a sign of respect. Right. And so you're saying, or if you're not aware or no, you say, this person's not even looking at me. You know, what's the matter with them? Time. <laughs> we won't pick on you, Antoinette. <laughs> yes, the laugh, the laugh. See, that's the other thing is I have had lots of experience with lots of different cultures. So I'll say things to people that people who don't know me are saying, how can you say that to me, you know? So time, we all have, yes. <laughs> Formality, even in, uh, I'm just looking at a lot of my students' papers, you know. 
come on, this is not how you write when you're writing an academic paper. There's formal language here, you know. So, uh, what are our views about formality? What's appropriate to wear? I had a friend in college who ate dinner in a jacket and tie and at home. At home. At home. Yeah. He, I went to Trinity College where he had a lot of wasps who, who were into that formality. Right. Depends. 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 Like Italians. Italians, yes. We always, at my grandmother's house, always had a pot of sauce on Sunday, and there was always a ton of pasta. So I had 18 cousins you know, and six uh, aunts and uncles. So you could have, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 people, and she would have enough food for everybody. So that was every Sunday. Yeah. So. But that was family, not just random friends. Oh, friends, friends and family. My mother said, I, you know, I have five boys and I have five kids from the neighborhood. So she always fed for fed ten. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Language obviously is another. And then attitudes about family. Okay. And food, you always feed, whether they're your family member, blood relations or not. Um, age and life cycle, attitudes about that. Touching and personal space. It's hard on the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's very geographic too. Yep. Yeah. I see. Food was mentioned. <coughs> and these are my favorites. Piaget talks about assimilation and accommodation. And as we look at the whole immigrant situation that's going on in this country, and how much does the country accommodate and how much does the immigrant assimilate? Okay, so these are the two tensions that are constantly going on. In your class, how much do you accommodate to a student and, or students, and how much should you encourage them to assimilate into your class culture? Whether it's how they write, how they raise their hand, how they speak. These are constant tensions that we all think about when they come to class. And then there's your knowledge, there's your attitudes. Obviously, awareness is the first step. There's your knowledge, uh, excuse me, your attitudes, and then your knowledge, okay? 
So as you move into about in the world and get more exposure to different cultures, um, you, you change the way that you behave, you change the way that you act. Um, now, um, individuals and organizations. If you're moving towards the far, far end of the continuum, your ability to demonstrate the capacity to value diver diversity. And then often, if, I don't know how many of you have attended diversity trainings, but there's the make a distinction between awareness of diversity, then there's that term tolerance, and then there's value diversity. Okay. So again, another continuum. Engage in self-reflection. And I think, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a self-help person. I read a lot of uh, books about self-help and self-actualization and from different cultures. And almost all of them talk about the importance of self-reflection and meditation. So um, making time. And we all know that in this modern day culture, we all complain about the lack of time. But they really talk about every day making time to reflect. Um, and facilitate effectively or even manage the dynamics of difference, acquire and institutionalize cultural knowledge, and adapt to the diversity and cultural context of the students, families, and communities they serve. So again, are we thinking about at capital not only the students in our classroom, but the families that they come from and at the community, the larger community that they come from, and what's the relationship we have? Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand that, that might be a struggle for them to try to decide where they fit in with all of that, but I kind of feel like our primary role is to educate them in what they came to learn about us. So. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's a personal thing. Um, you know, I think that we, that's why I put up the slide about par from Parker Palmer is about how much effort are you going to put in as an instructor to relate to your students, appreciate your students. Some faculty, I'm sure, say, I'm here to teach X, and that's it. So again, these are all personal decisions, you know. Um. Right. Yeah, this, this is not a one-way street, right? It's also their role, students. I just did it this way because of time, and for us as staff and educators here, that, uh, for us to think about our own. Um, and it starts with us first. Um, uh, and then support actions which foster equality and opportunity and services. So think a minute about you as the individual and think about us or we at Capital Community College and what do we do as an institution and what do we need to do as an institution. Names. With your students, how do you approach the issue of names? You get them all mixed up.
and I stress that I want to make sure that I pronounce their names correctly, mm -hmm. and that I make little notes to myself yeah. and I do yeah. just yeah. Yeah. do things <laughs> phonetically so that hopefully the next time it'll get better and better as I do these things. So I'm hearing it. You make an effort yeah. to yeah. pronounce their names. Okay. Some people don't. I've seen some people. You know. Oh, Melinda, um, you know, Margaret, whatever your name is, you know, there's, there's those people that are out there too. And I've also seen in conversations Or how many people tell me they don't know the students in their class? I mean, they don't know their names, and it's like, oh, you know, oh, you weren't in my, you were in my class, you know. They, and again, there's yeah, the re students fault. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> there are realities of those instructors who are teaching large classes too. If you're teaching four classes, right, and you know, right. but I try to make a point of um, learning my student's name on the first class, and I do uh, exercise where. You know, they have to give me an adjective to describe their name. But not only did I learn their names, I want them to learn each other's names. I get blown away at, you know, you know, oh, that girl over there, you know, how come she, what happened to her? They don't even know her name, you know? So I spend time, I did a Gestalt workshop, a Gestalt in Education workshop with, with Marie this summer. And just being in tune with your students just on the, with the names, I think, and building that community, that environment that's conducive to, to learning is, is important. Do you do an activity? For, for the, the first day of class, what yeah. Do do? Well, I do the adjective. Come up with, you know, I teach English, so come up with an adjective that begins with the same letter as your, as, your, as, your, as your first name. And so, you know, part of it is, is the vocabulary building, and there's some laughs, and then I say, okay, after I do five, then I'll go, okay, Kevin, the five people that went before you, what are their names and what are their adjectives? And so then, then we go, and then, Laura, you'd have to say everyone's, and so everyone has to try to remember everybody's name. Carl, another great trick for learning students' names fast, and again, if you teach a class of 70 people, this is, you know, this is, How do you feel about other languages spoke, spoken in your classroom? I mean, obviously, for teaching English in the ESL program, actually, the research shows that it really doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, so I kind of chide my instructors when they say, oh, the kids speak Spanish in the class. Um, because they're there for such a short period of time, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. But, um, standard and non-standard language. Okay. Uh, what are other things as an individual, as an educator or a staff person? Let's talk about us as educators. I mean, at Capital Community College, beside, that relate to cultural competency that go beyond names and language. Knowing where people are from. Where they're from, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I make a point of, like I said, if they come from a country I've never heard of, to try to, try to say something uh, to them. I also try to say something to them in their native language. I would make a point of trying to, obviously, if you have 20 different languages in your class, it's, it's a little more difficult, but I try to learn how to, I've tried to learn how to say hello or something in, in their native language. But again, I'm an ESL teacher. It's a difference. It's an activity at the beginning of uh, first day of semester and everyone gets in a circle and I ask questions and um, for example uh, those of you that were born um, in a different country come into the circle and then you get to share and then we just uh, we, we share things like that how many of you have traveled to other countries how many of you have five or more children in your family how many of you have a dog you know they, and then it's a fun way of sharing fun facts about each other yeah 
Any, anything else? <laughs> okay, at, at Capital Community College. Forgot this is being videotaped. Signage. We were in San Diego but last week. Everything was bilingual. You've been on the highway. Yeah. Just us. bilingual or multilingual? Multilingual. Spanish and English. Okay. I, I didn't notice any others. Did you notice any others? But like in the museums and stuff, the art museums, history museums, all that kind of stuff, science museums, they had labels in Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. Yes. I um, had the good fortune to get to Wales in the summer, and the first time it was Welsh and English is under the name. They're very, very proud of the national language, and it's everywhere. Unpronounceable to me. Um, I'm really glad to see that. They teach it in their schools, and um, it's prioritized. In my previous life as a literacy advocate, um, what you'll see in most other countries, I'm sure you know, you've seen this as well, or those of you who've lived outside of the United States, is they don't have any language. They use icons, yeah. right? I mean, we see them in the men's room, in the, in the women's room, that's, a, that's about it. But we don't see a lot of icons in this country. We're very language specific and much more than other countries. But in other countries, they use um, lots of icons to express signage. Um, and uh, because most, many other countries, you have more than one language, and they promote more than one language. It tells you a lot about the cultural politics of the country. I mean, if you go to a small town way off in the sticks in Nova Scotia, and you'll see signs in English and in French. You go to Quebec, you'll find signs in French. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And um, in Singapore, they have four official languages, and all the signage is in English. That's the bridge language. Yeah. And in, in, when I lived in Spain, most people do, don't know that Spain has three official languages. Okay. Spanish is not the official language of Spain. It used to be under Franco, but no longer. You have Catalan, you have Gallego, and you have Castellano, which is what we call Spanish. Okay. And it would bother me when I would go to Barcelona. That's a big rivalry between Barcelona and Madrid. I lived in Madrid, but it would piss me off when I would go to Barcelona and they would answer, I would talk to them in Castellano, they would answer me in Catalan, you know, because they're very proud and they've been oppressed for so many years. Again, there's lots of history, but anyway. Materials. Any materials that we should have that are more culturally sensitive? Again, brochures. I did a lot of work with health literacy and um, a big problem in health field that people even who are English speakers, not understanding what health professionals are saying. You know, if someone tells you you have cancer, you're probably not going to understand much what they say afterwards. And so you off, I often feel like I need to have someone go with me when I go to the doctor because that information is so poorly conveyed. And so materials, okay, here's what you need for diabetes. Read this brochure, okay? And so, um, I don't know how much we do that at Capital, but there are a lot of written materials. We tend to be much more of a verbal society. Um, and there's just a lot of lack of, or assumption. And we find this, we talked about this at the COWS meeting. You give a student a rating, you assume that they understood what they read. You cannot do that, okay? And so in our materials, how can we make them understandable? Activities or events? How many cultural activities and events do we have at Capitol? Not enough. Not enough. Okay. And I tell my students always, keep it simple. <laughs> Try to keep your sentences simple. <laughs> and I say, remember the golden rule, okay? So treat people the way you want to be treated. Here are just two resources. Um, yep. One of the things I've heard, just, uh, which I think is worth noting, is not just to treat people how you want to be treated, treat people how they want to be treated, right? There's a certain level of like respect, and I guess that's embedded in the treat people how you want to be treated. You want to be treated the way you want to be treated. But I, I, at a diversity training a couple of years ago, they said, well, okay, but the handshake, for instance, or the eye, you know, look, eye contact, all these other things are not, you might want to be treated that way, but someone else may not. So right. Embedded in that same should be try to understand what they would want 
not just what you would want and foist that upon them, because I think that's one of the things we do too. We assume that, again, that's the assimilation versus accommodation. We assume, oh, you should absorb the shaking hands thing or whatever. That person may want to give you a hug or something. We have to be aware, though, of when, whenever we can respect those those other things to kind of accommodate within the within the realms of acceptability, I guess. We should do that too. Yeah. 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 I mean, this past semester I had a Muslim couple come in and the husband introduced himself. I put out my hand, shook it, put out my hand to his wife, yeah. and she's just stood there. Yeah. And I'm saying it took me a minute to say, you know, why aren't you shaking my hand? <laughs> Duh. Okay. So all right, so these are two. The National Center for Cultural Competence in Georgetown is lots of material. It's a website. If you email me, I will email you this presentation um, if you would like it. Or, but these are, they have a lot of resources uh, and all kinds of stuff. And then the Center for Effective Collaboration Practices, an educator's website. So there's a lot of material there. And then I'm going to give you this. Um, uh, which is a very thorough analysis of your inv teaching environment. And it's more probably appropriate for a K through 12 teacher. It talks about your classroom and how can you make your classroom more inviting. Um, but it's, I'd rather give you more than, than less, so thanks. And that's it. <laughs>